As we continue in this series called Jesus First, I'd like us to look at the book of 2 Timothy. The book of 2 Timothy. We're going to finish out chapter 1 this morning. Last week we covered um, verses 1 and 2, and I'm going to dive this week into the rest of the chapter. So we're going to start in verse 3. When you have it, I would love for us to stand together and give honor to God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 1 in verse 3. It says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. As without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we ask you this morning that you would open up the scriptures to us. We know if we just study it for ourselves and we're just looking at it with human eyes, it's not going to mean anything to us, Lord. So I pray that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand. Enliven us with your Holy Spirit so that we can understand what you want us to understand this morning out of your Holy Word. I I do pray, Lord, that we would approach this time of of study in in your scripture, not just like another time. It's just not another Sunday that we get to... Just sit in here and listen, Lord, but I pray that we would approach this as a holy and sacred time to come face to face with you in your word. I pray that you would show yourself to us. I pray that you would speak to us through this. Speak to our hearts. I pray, Lord, that every time we encounter you in your, in your word, that we would come away changed. That we wouldn't be the same people that we used to be. But, Lord, that we would be a, a unique people, a called out people, a peculiar people that look like you and talk like you and, and act like you, Lord, that we would impact this community for your cause and in your name. I pray, Lord, that you would help us understand what you have us to hear today in your name. Amen. You can be seated. So I have, and Mindy can attest to this, I have a notoriously bad memory. I mean, really, really, really bad. I remember, like, vividly things from sixth grade and up. But anything from my childhood, from sixth grade and down, it's like bits and pieces, just flashes of stuff. Like, when I was your all's age right there, I, I don't remember. I don't remember much of it. Just like what my parents tell me. So now, I have to write down everything that happens to me in a day. I keep a journal like this with me and another journal with me just to write down things that happen. Otherwise, I do not remember. And so I don't want to keep forgetting this just the way that that my brain is wired. But when I look back as deep as I can into my past, I mean, when I struggle and I strain and people are making funny looks at me, when I look back and try to remember what what my childhood looked like, what I can remember, the most vivid flashes of memory in my mind are my family and the legacy of faith that they instilled in me. That's what I remember. My earliest memory was when I was five years old, and I could remember sitting in Sunday school listening to my grandma teach us scripture stories, lessons from the Bible. I remember that vividly. Her bright red hair, I remember it so clearly. I remember sitting on my grandpa's lap. And, and listening to him read scripture to me. I remember the caramel candies my grandma would give when we would memorize verses. I, I remember we would try to memorize as many as we could so we could get as many caramels as we could. I remember my mom and her flannel graph. Do you all remember flannel graph? The, the big pieces and then the Bible stories they would stick on and tell. I remember her telling kids the stories of, uh, of Jesus, the stories of him healing the, the blind man, the stories uh, of the woman at the well. I remember those stories so vividly, how all the characters looked the same, just with different colored beards. I remember them so well. But the thing I remember more than anything else was my dad in the pulpit. I, I remember that so clearly. I, I can visualize it so well. Him standing in the pulpit like this, holding the Bible up. I, I, I see this picture in my head every time that I look back. And you know what? I was, I was a troublemaker as a kid. I was, you, you may look at me now and say, no, he, he, was, he was one of those goody two-shoe kids. And I was not. I was, I was awful as a kid. I was hyper. And then when I was a teenager, I was rebellious. It was, it was rough. My parents prayed for me relentlessly, and I needed every ounce of prayer that they could muster. Because I made some bad choices. 
But my family prayed for me. For zealots are stubborn. And they stubbornly insisted that I get to know Jesus. And I am so grateful for that today. I am so grateful today that I remember getting up in the morning and seeing my mom and dad on their hands and knees praying for us on the patio. I remember that. I remember them praying for us at night. I remember him asking me, what, what, what Bible verses are you, did you read today? What are you memorizing today? They instilled in me a legacy of faith. And as we open up the book of 2 Timothy, I see this from Paul to Timothy. Remember, we talked about this last week that Paul wrote 2 Timothy as his last letter. This is the last thing he wrote before he died, before he was martyred. And so he writes this to his protege, Timothy. He says, Timothy, I love you. And I want you to see one thing, and it's that Jesus should be first. Jesus should be first in what you do. And so number one, if you're following along in your bulletins, is this. A legacy of faith. If we want to get to know Jesus, if we want to, to have any kind of power in this life, it's got to start with Jesus first. And that, 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 that thought and that idea has to penetrate into our faith, has to penetrate into our faith. So Paul writes Timothy and he says, you've got a legacy of faith that has been instilled in you. He says in verse 3, my forefathers taught me how to serve God. And then he said in verse 5, your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice taught you how to serve God. I love that they pull out the grandma. Isn't that awesome that Paul is like, by name, your grandma Lois. Like, I, I know her and she, she taught you about scripture. And I, that resonates so deeply with me because both of my grandmas were like that. They taught me scripture. They taught me what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. And so he says, listen to him. Listen to him. They instilled this in you. And you know what it tells me to tell you today? Grandparents, you've got a lot of influence in your grandkids. A lot of influence. You have no idea. 30 years from now, your grandkids could be standing in a pulpit saying, my grandma taught me about God's word. Or my grandpa led me to the Lord. How about this? Parents. Parents. Instill a legacy of faith in your kids. From the tiny baby sitting right there to teenagers growing up. To, to men and women who have grown up. Parents, you can instill a legacy of faith in your kids. Church members. Look at these kids here, all up and down the front, instill a legacy of faith in them. Older teenagers, you can instill a legacy of faith in the younger kids. Don't ever let somebody tell you that you have to grow up before you can serve the Lord. Timothy was a pastor when he was still a teenager. So we see this, this idea that Paul says is we need to instill this legacy of faith because that's how the gospel is transmitted. There's a, uh, an Irish preacher uh, and his name uh, is Keith Malcolmson. And he said this, the gospel has been preached man to man, ear to ear, heart to heart in an unbroken line from the days of the apostles. I love that. I love that idea because it means that we're part of something bigger. When you share the gospel with somebody, it's not just oh, me telling a story. It's you repeating the same story that Jesus himself told his disciples in the, hill, in the hillside countries of Galilee. How crazy is this that we're part and fortunate enough to be part of this, this unbroken line of sharing the gospel. And you know what's scary to me is look at this next generation in this world. We were talking about this in Sunday school this morning. How scary this world is starting to look. How messed up it's starting to look. There's no right or wrong anymore. You get that? I mean, people are saying, whatever is my truth is, is you know, could be good for me, but not for anybody else. But I tell you this, I'm going to stand on this truth. Of God's word. It's important for us. We're only ever one generation away from our church and from faith in, faith in totality becoming extinct. It's, it's up to us to carry on that unbroken line. And so Paul stresses this point with Timothy. You've had some people in your life. You've had lots of people build into you a legacy of faith. Seek after Jesus. And you know, parents and grandparents, it's not about shoving the Bible in kids' faces. I grew up with a lot of pastors, kids, and missionary kids around me. And man, when I saw those parents who were militant about you, you will do this and you will love God's word. My dad would always say when we were complaining, he always said, you are going to have a fun time and you're going to enjoy it or you're going to get a spanking. And so we were always like, okay, I'll have fun so I don't get in trouble. Right. But, 
But, you know, I look at this and I think it's not about shoving the Bible in kids' faces. It's not about forcing kids to memorize scripture. It's not, you can't force someone to be a Christian. If I could force someone or influence someone to be a Christian, guess what? Somebody else could influence them and force them to not be a Christian. That's a work of God in their lives. That's a work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And so what we do, parents, is do what Paul did. Look at what he says in verse 3. It starts with your own faith. It starts with your own faith. He says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. He says, I serve. And then he goes on to say, without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers day and night. If you want to impact the next generation, it starts on your knees before Almighty God. That's where it starts. It starts with me praying for my family. It starts, for, it starts with me in my personal walk with Jesus Christ. I, I tell you how many times have you had to say to, to your kids, do as I say, not as I do. Right? If we ever had to say that, sometimes we're, we're very careful now about what we say in our house because Chloe repeats everything. Everything. She'll repeat everything. And so I'll say a word that we're not supposed to say, not a bad word, just a word that we don't want her saying. And Mindy's like, you can't say that. She's going to repeat that. And then it'll pop up at the worst times. I swear, if she says something in Sunday school, I'm going to be so embarrassed, right? But this idea that if we, if we want our kids to, to live out their faith, Hello, we got to live out our own faith. I've got to get on my knees and pray. It's up to us, church. Pray. Pray like Paul. Pray day and night without ceasing. Pray for these young people in our church. Pray for the young people in your family. Pray for your own children. You may have a prodigal this morning who has wandered away from the Lord. Don't ever stop praying for him. The Lord, he, he works. He continues to work. And he'll lead them back if we would just pray. And be faithful. And you know what? Celebrate small victories with your kids and with the people around you. When Chloe decides to pray at night, sometimes she prays some weird things. <laughs> Occasionally she'll pray, thank you, Lord, for the jungle. And I'm always like, why <laughs> the jungle? Thank you for my snacks. She loves that one. And thank you for my stuffed animals. But you know what? Every time she starts to pray, no matter if it's for a meal or for bedtime, this is what she prays. Dear Jesus Thank you for my mom and dad. Thank you for my friends at church. I love that. I'm tearing up just thinking about it. And we hug her and we tell her, Jesus loves to hear you pray. He loves to hear you pray. He wants to hear from you. And that is how you build a legacy of faith in you. Paul looks at Timothy and he knows Timothy. Okay. He spent time with Timothy. So he kind of Changes this section a little bit from, I love you and I'm wanting to see you. And I remember the time that you, you shed tears when we, when we parted. But then he turns it around in verse 6. Therefore, I remind you. Have you ever had a parent say, now I remind you. Or a, t a principal, now let's be reminded. And you're like, okay, now I need to sit up straight and remember what I'm supposed to hear. He says to Timothy, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you. That, that idea of stirring up the gift of God is, is the idea of a fire that's dying down. And you need to breathe new life into it. You need to stoke it up. You need to put more fuel on the fire. So he's saying, Timothy, don't lose heart. Don't lose hope. Don't let the fire burn down. I, you have a gift in you. You have a gift to preach and to reach people. God gave you a tremendous gift. So let it burn for Jesus. Move toward Jesus. Think about Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And so he knows, though, he knows Timothy, and he knows that Timothy is both shy and doesn't like confrontation. I, I, I can commiserate with Timothy. I do not like confrontation. There's some people that thrive on it. When, when, it, gets, when it gets awkward and there's going to be some kind of confrontation, I'm, I'm usually the first one out the door. I don't, I, don't want, I, don't, I don't like that. It makes me uncomfortable, right? So he tells Timothy, this gift of God that's in you, that you're stirring up and you're, and, you're, and you're making new in your life. Look at this. Look what happens to it. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. He says, Timothy, if you would just take hold of the gospel that I've preached to you, it's power in your life. It's power in your life. Listen, parents, it's power to change your children. 
Grandparents, it's power to influence your, your grandchildren. Church, it's power. Romans 1.16 says that the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all those who believe. In, in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, As many as received him, Jesus gave them power to become the sons of God. We carry this Bible around sometimes like it's worth nothing. I remember one time hearing it when I was a youth pastor, hearing of a youth group that played a shuffleboard with Bibles, old Bibles that were in the church. And I thought, oh man, that, that makes me so nervous that lightning is going to strike your, your, your church. And I know that's not like that, but I look and I say, this, this word is power. It's power for us. And I think a lot of Christians are living their life on 1% battery. I think we go through life and we maybe go to church once in a while. We get a little bit of fix and then we go home and we live our lives like, like we want to. And Paul says, listen, the, the word that's been preached to you, the gift that's in you is power. A legacy of faith. Number two, as we move on, saving faith. A saving faith. I'm going to read starting in verse eight. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which has been given to us in who? Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, who? Jesus Christ who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. That was one long sentence. If you didn't catch that in your, in your Bible, that was one big sentence we just read. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed for I know whom I've believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him until that day. I, I love this. I, I love this section. I think this is one of the most beautiful pieces of literature that has ever been written. So Paul starts this out. What word starts out verse 8? Therefore or so. Anytime you see the word therefore in scripture, look back into the text that you just read because there's a reason it's there. Look to see where the, what the therefore is there for. Okay, that was from my dad and I can't believe I just said that. Um, <laughs> He said that for so many years, and I always made fun of him for that. Um, but look back into it. Okay, so therefore. Okay, you can't just start a sentence with therefore unless you're referencing something. So what did he just reference? He just referenced that the gospel produces a spirit, not of fear, but of what? Power in us. So therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. If you know that this is powerful, then there's no reason for us to be ashamed of it. And he's going to tell us why. Some people are ashamed of this message. And he's going to go into this in a little bit. But he says this, okay, th this is power for you. And it's not for us to be fearful, but it's for us to conquer. It's for us to make a difference in, in people's lives. It's for us to look at Jesus and say, you are changing things in this world. The faith that puts Jesus first is a saving faith. I think a lot of people look at Jesus a lot of different ways, okay? I think a lot of people like the intellectual Jesus. They, they look, some people look at Jesus and say, he was a good teacher. Well, was he not a good teacher? I mean, he taught us to, to, you know, to love our enemies and to do good to those who, who hurt us and to pray for those who spitefully use us. He told us to turn the other cheek when someone strikes us. He told us uh, to, to go into all the world. These are good things, right? I mean, they're good. A lot of people want to stick there, though, and say, well, that's the Jesus that I want to follow. Other people look at Jesus and say, I love the social activist Jesus, the one who's out there, like, changing things and feeding people and healing lepers. Well, that's my Jesus. But they forget that both of those things are byproducts of the real reason why Jesus came, and that was to bring the kingdom of God in faith to sinners. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus came. He came because we had separated ourselves from him in sin. And he came to give us new life through his blood. And so Paul says here, okay, you want to hear about power? This is where your power comes from. Look at verse 9. He saved us. He saved us. 
And he called us with a holy calling. Church, we're not here this morning just to, just to get our quick Christian fix and go home and think everything is all right. You're here because you were called with a holy and sacred calling. God preordained you to be part of his church this morning. This is, this is deep and this is sacred. This isn't something to take lightly. Some people treat going to church like, what restaurant are we going to go to later? Well, we got the Methodist, we got you know, the Church of Christ, we got the Catholic Church. Let's, let's just pick which church we want. No, it's not about that. Take this seriously. He says, you were called with a holy calling, not according to our works. That's the core of the gospel right there. It's not according to anything I've done because I can't do anything good enough. I can't. I tried. I, I tried. I, I helped old ladies cross the street. I adopted puppies. Uh, you know, when that, that uh, American Society for the Animal Cruelty thing came on, every time those commercials come on, I feel bad, right? I feel bad for those puppies out in the cold, right? I, we've done those things, but they, they're not saving things. They're good things, but they're not saving things. And he says, listen, if you're going to put your faith in something that's powerful, how about in the saving blood of Jesus Christ? We put our faith in a lot of different things. You put your faith in your alarm clock to wake you up this morning. And sometimes it fails us. You put your faith in your car to get you here. You put, you're putting your faith right now in the pews that you're sitting in that they're not going to topple over. And now everybody's like, oh, is that a concern that I should have? You're putting your faith in our building that it's not going to collapse. You put our faith in a lot of things. But this is what Paul is saying. There's a thing that's more important than all that. And that's to put our faith in Jesus Christ, in him first. And so he says, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Keep going in verse 10. What has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And listen, this is what he did for you. He has abolished death and brought life. That, that's it. That's the story of the gospel. People say, I don't know how to share my faith. I'm too scared. I don't, I don't know what to do. Well, what if they ask me a question? This is it. This is the core of it. Christ abolished death and brought life. I mean, that's it. That's the core of it. There's a pastor named David Guzik, and he said this, death is not death, not for the believer. Death is just sleep. And I love that. He, he, Jesus made death obsolete. For us, it's not something that we should fear, but it's something that we should, I say this with a, with, with a caveat, we should embrace. Okay, not, not being suicidal, but being, but being ready. Because when I close my eyes here on this earth, I get to open my eyes in the face of my Savior. I'm not afraid of that. I'm not afraid of that. Today, 61 years ago, a man named Jim Elliott stood on a beach in, in, in the country of Peru, in the country of Ecuador, I'm sorry. And, and he stood there as, as tribal people came at him with spears. And he laid out his life so that they could know the gospel. And he said this famous quote, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I give my life for the gospel's sake because it's powerful, because it changes, because it saved me, because he called me with a holy calling. This is what we share. He's, he's tying all these, these ends together. He's saying, Timothy, instill this legacy of faith in other people. And what is this legacy of faith? It's a saving faith. It's a powerful faith. He encourages him. This is what you believe in. This is what you get up in the morning for. This is what propels you and compels you to start another day. Your faith has got to be built on this. If your faith is built on church attendance, it's not going to save you. If your faith is built on the fact that you were baptized, it's not going to save you. If your faith is built on the times that you've served... Even if you've served 50 years, that's not going to save you. What's going to save you is when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you. Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose. And Paul is saying here, listen, I didn't expect at the end of my life to be in prison. But he said, I'm okay with it because it's worth it. The, the power of the gospel is worth it. Because I'm persuaded that what I gave to the Lord, my heart, and my soul, he's able to keep that. 
He's able to keep that until he comes back. He's not going to lose it. So he says it's worth it. Every minute I spend in prison, every, every chain and every pain I, that I endure, it's worth it because Jesus is my prize. Jesus is my greatest reward. For Paul, it's Jesus first. So we've seen a legacy of faith and we've seen saving faith. Now Paul is going to get practical as he ends out his, uh, his chapter here. We're going to start reading in verse 13. He says this. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among, those, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Anesiphorus, for he has often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and he found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. So now Paul's kind of tying the strings. He's putting it all together. He's saying, okay, this faith that's been instilled in you, it's a saving faith. It's a powerful faith. And here's what it looks like practically in your life. All right, he gives two examples. One of them is uh, those in Asia and these two crazy names, Hermogenes and, and Phygelus or something like that. Okay? We see these two people, we know nothing about them in Scripture except for the fact that they abandoned the Apostle Paul at his greatest hour of need. Can you imagine if that was your legacy? <laughs> Like, you make it into the Bible. There's tons of people, thousands of people who don't even get mentioned by name. And then you get these two jokers, and they get their name in the Bible for this reason, that they abandoned Paul when he needed him the most. Gosh, man, that, that, that hurts my heart. I pray that that's not my legacy. You know, a hundred years from now, when people look back and they look at Mark and they say, well, he, he, he abandoned the Lord when, when, you know, when, when, it, when it was going to cost him. Because that was the issue. Being associated with somebody who was a, a political prisoner was a dangerous thing for a Christian. I don't want, want to be associated with that. I don't, I'm going to step back from that. It's like when somebody is, uh, you know, represents a brand, like an athlete represents a brand, and then they get in trouble with the law. And all of a sudden, all the brands say, okay, we're pulling out of this because we don't want anything to do with that. So Phygelis and Hermogenes, they, they, they step away and said, we can't be a part of Paul. He's, he's too dangerous. He's in prison. He's going to ruin our reputation. It may cost us prison time. That's a, that's, a, that's a terrible example. And that's their legacy forever. Forever and ever and ever. As long as the, the, the word of God is being preached, these two men will be preached as people who abandon the gospel. So Paul's telling Timothy, don't be like those. Don't be like those guys. Instead, hold fast. He says, hold fast to the pattern of sound words which I preach to you. When I hear that, I always think of a running back who's just been handed a football. Okay, hold fast to it. I, I grew up in a country where we didn't play football, and we, we played soccer and basketball. That's all we played. So when I came back to the States and I had to play football sometimes, it was, it was a little bit like I have no idea what I'm doing, and I know I'm about to get very, very hurt. I, I, they would hand me the ball, and I'm like, just point me in the direction, and I'll run. I knew the, the basics of it, and, and I'll look, and I'll say, okay, so basically the other team wants to destroy me, <laughs> and, that's, and that's it. And they said, yeah, so just don't let up. And so I'm like, okay, but right, so Paul is saying, listen, I'm handing you this gospel, this powerful gospel that changes everything. Hold on to it. Don't let it go. The enemy is going to try to bring you down. And we're reading in the book of Nehemiah in our Sunday school. Whenever you try to build something for the Lord or do something for the Lord, Satan is going to be there. He's going to be there and he's going to try to bring it down. Satan doesn't want you to, to, to do anything for the Lord. He doesn't want your, your success. He doesn't want that for you. And so Paul says, hold fast. And now he says, don't be like these people, but do be, do be, do be, do. Don't be like... Uh, this a doobie like this guy, Onesiphorus, in verse 16, the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. I'm sorry, if I didn't tell you number three was examples of faith. <laughs> People are like, please tell me what it was. Examples of faith. So this guy, Onesiphorus, equally, we know nothing about him. It's the same. It's the same situation with these other two guys. We don't know where he came from. We don't know what church he was a part of. But look at the difference in him. Look at the difference in him. He often refreshed me. That word it means a cool breeze on a hot day. I like to think of it as a cold glass of ice cold sweet tea after you mow the lawn. 
right? It's this, this guy, he made me feel better. He came to me and he encouraged me. It says he sought me out. He sought me very zealously and he wasn't ashamed of my chains. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy. And you know very well how he ministered to me. This guy is the exact opposite of the first two guys. And Paul is saying, listen, Timothy, be like this guy. Be like this guy. Refresh the people around you. When you walk through a room, be a cool breeze. Right? But he says, Paul and Timothy, refresh people, minister to people, seek people out, instill that legacy of saving faith in people. And this is how you do. Church, I, I want you to think back for done. It's almost time to, to close up shop here, but I want us to think back really quick. Who was the person that led you to faith in Christ? Who was it? Think about it. Was it your pastor? Was it a Sunday school teacher? Was it your parent or grandparent? I want you to think back. I want, I want you to look back. I know my memory is poor. Hopefully yours is not. Look back as deep as you can. Think about their face. Think about what they told you. Think about the setting. Where were you when you gave your, your heart to Christ? I can remember clearly, I mean vividly. It was October 19, 2002. My dad shared the gospel. And for the first time in my life, the Holy Spirit opened my heart and I understood it. And I gave my heart to Christ. I knelt next to my waterbed in Bolivia. We, we both had waterbeds because we didn't have heat in our house. So we could turn our waterbeds up and then keep us warm. And I, I remember, I remember my elbows kind of going with the rhythm of the waterbed waves. And I remember praying and saying, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I can't fight anymore. I, I give you everything I am. I give you my heart. And I let it go and have it your way. I prayed that. Do you remember where you were when you prayed that prayer? Do you remember who it was? And here's my challenge for you. Be that person for someone else. Be that person for someone else. How about 20 or 30 or 40 years from now? I want a young person to stand in this church and say, I remember who it was that led me to the Lord. It was Eileen. Or it was Elizabeth. Or it was Winfield. I want, I want that. I want, that's my challenge for us. To look and have that, that faith that puts Jesus 